Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Tucker Johnson, and I am your host today as we all experience NIMSY Live, where we talk about the latest and the greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff global companies need to delight their international customers, or at least not piss them off too much. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. I'm always eager to provide a platform to those with a good story or a good data set. So let us know if there are any topics you'd like covered or guests we should reach out to for future episodes. If you haven't already done so, make sure that you are following or subscribed to NIMSY Insights. You'll be the first to know when we host new events or get new events on the schedule or when NIMSY Insights publishes new market research, which you can find available at NIMSY.com, of course. A little bit about the platform for those of you that are joining us today. Uh, most people join these things on LinkedIn, and if that's you, or if you're joining on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you are, you can participate in the comments section. We'll bring your comments up on screen right here. So if you have any questions, comments, or stories yourself, then make sure to be sharing with the rest of the class. Getting right into it today, uh, well, let me introduce the, today's topic. Did you know that the amount of contact the content humanity produces daily is estimated to be 2.5 quintillion bytes. That's more bytes of text than the stars in the observable universe. Today, to talk about this and the revolutions that are happening in the language tech space and that have happened in the language tech space, we have Bart Monchinski, VP of Machine Learning at Language Weaver. He's going to share with us how the translation industry is coping with the explosion of content and the challenges it faces in meeting demand. Bart, welcome to the show. Nice to have you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, before before we get into a little bit um, into the main topic, let, let's talk about you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about Language Weaver. I know we've we've talked about Language Weaver on the show before, um, but go ahead and int introduce yourself here. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Bart Malczynski, I live just outside of Washington, D.C. I have been with the company that is now uh, Language Weaver for quite a while. I actually started uh, my career with Trados in the year 2000 um, here in uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, which which was where that company was headquartered. And then I lived through the subsequent acquisitions um, and changed jobs within the company. Uh, so Trados, as probably you know, uh, was acquired by SDL and then um, uh, SDL was buying other companies and technologies over time. And then um, RWS Group acquired uh, SDL and all those uh, components of the company. Um, that gave me a pretty good um, insight into the workings of the translation industry because I started with nuts and bolts, you know, translation memory, cat tools. Um, I had trained as a translator originally and worked as a translator before I came to the United States. And um, a lot has changed in the last 20 years. Let's, let's just put it that way. Right. You've seen, you've seen, you've seen it all. And we're, I, I like to call RWS the Kevin Bacon of the localization industry. All, you know, there's always less seven degrees or less of separation back to RWS. I work for Moravia myself. So we have, we have that in common. We're cousins. Uh, yeah. Today, the um, the topic that we're, we're we're looking at an article that you wrote. And this is where I I I wanted to reach out to you about in the what is it the February issue of Multilingual Magazine. For those of you out there, if you're not subscribed to Multilingual Magazine, check it out. You get these cool print editions every month. This one came with the Language Technology Atlas poster, which is really cool. But the article that you wrote is. Let me bring it up on screen here. How to future proof? How to future proof today's machine translation? And this is, you know, this is a topic that we've been covering quite a bit, not just via Multilingual Magazine, but in Nimsy Insights. Everyone's really interested in what's happening with machine translation, particularly um, coinciding with the the rise of large language models, chat GPT and all of that stuff, which I'm sure we're not going to be able to avoid talking about today. 
But um, going to your article here, I, I loved in your intro, you talked about a book called The Third Wave. And let me just pull it up on screen here. The, the, um, the Third Wave by Al Alvin Toffler. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to quote from your article here, and we can talk about this. In 1980, the American writer and futurologist Alvin Toffler published a book entitled The Third Wave. The book talked about the transition from the industrial age, which was the second wave, to the information age, the third wave, describing some characteristics of the future society. A move from standardization to personalization, the gradual loss of societal consensus, and the eclipse of manufacturing goods by manufacturing knowledge. The world we live in now is not that far from Toffler's predictions. This is pretty prophetic. Yes, I think it's an amazing insight. And, um, you know, it may not be possible to um, precisely determine the technologies of the future or how they will work. Um, but if you are observant and can, um, you're not afraid to make certain uh, predictions, mm. you can extrapolate from uh, what you're observing, right? So um, I think that. Um, it doesn't matter if we are going to walk around with a TV on our wrist, which may have been something that in 1950s people thought would be the future. Um, we don't have the flying cars, so not yet. Not yet. Probably not yet. I still got um, my fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, I can. I can imagine the the beltway around DC uh, once that happens. But um, but it's really um, remarkable how much the world has changed in in the last. 40 years um, in terms of um, information technology um, and cost of access, um, mm. right? So um, the internet uh, changed everything. And I think um, in some ways that those large language models can, can make another shift for the whole, uh, for the whole of humanity one way or the other. And, and in the language industry, when, when we see shifts like this happening, big shifts with technology, dis I, I hesitate to use the word disruption because um, mm -hmm. I think it's overused, but big, big shifts forward, let's say, in technology, we kind of have to look at it from two perspectives, I think. And the first perspective, I think, is personally, I think is the best way to look at it, which is how is this going to change the type of work that we are doing? So for example, with the internet, with, the, well, I'd say the internet's a disruptive change, but let's just say, you know, this, this third wave that, that we're talking about here, this move from um, standardization to personalization, as, as you so mm -hmm. well put it. And when we're looking at how that's going to change how we do the work or the type of work that we're doing, it means more content, right? So any anytime there's a big shift, it's like, all right, the type of content that's going to need to be translated is changing. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is how are we within the language services industry going to leverage this technology to do a better job or change the way that we work? So one way of looking at it is what is going to change. And the other way of looking at it is how our jobs are going to change. And with all that's going on right now with artificial intelligence, I would say we need to be concerned about both. And I'm not typically an alarmist on this. What would you think? Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, I think um, whether you're a pessimist or optimist about these new um, advanced AI uh, um, models, you have to agree that our lives will change. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes these things are not obvious, right? That, so we can talk about um, things like um, empathy hacking, where a machine can use language in a manipulative way to get an outcome from a human being, right? That these are big philosophical, ethical problems. But even on a much smaller um, scale, you can Look, look at the translation memory and how it formed the translation industry back in the day. And it continues to this day. Um, the way you pay for translation, the per word rate, the way you 
calculate how much to pay based on matches from the translation memory. This is still pervasive. This is anyone it, in the translation. There's a debate whether it should still be pervasive, right? right. There's a big debate that I think needs to be had around like, is this fuzzy match per word model still the best model? Regardless, why do we do that? Because that was dictated by this mechanical approach of translation memory, right? Um, the the debate how we should how we should charge and how we should pay for translation will be reinvigorated because now with those large language models, when you apply them to text generation and and um, translation, um, well, they have a sense of context and they have a state. They remember the previous prompts, so um, maybe injecting human linguistic expertise into the output of the machine has to change completely. Mm. So, um, but um, one other thing that you said that, um, you know, the, how our personal life is going to change. Um, the, the interesting thing about um, translation memory and translation management systems, and to some extent also uh, neural machine translation, is that in some ways they were all linked or designed to uh, help or used uh, for helping the translation professional. Mm -hmm. Now you can see with machine translation the departure from that because it serves um, a lot of use cases where human intervention is not necessary or not possible. But with those large language models, um, with content generation with content understanding with insights you can see um, another whole world of use cases that we may not have yet you know been able to predict and that's going to be very interesting now the question is where's the what's the danger here the, the danger is that um, there are not many things at which humans are very good as a species um, and language is one of them That's fair. And understanding and producing language is one of them so we are kind of uh, giving up the last frontier of advantage that we have on, <laughs> on we're, this planet. we're outsourcing our core competency as, exactly. as one thing as a consultant i have to tell you never outsource your core competency right exactly. and that's a good point we're, we're kind of doing that as a species you sum it up very well in, in your article, you, and you call this the translation memories, the, the TM, or the first revolution. Um, let me just read for those listening um, and via the podcast. The first revolution. Even though translation memory was invented in the 1970s, our story begins in the late 1990s when TM technology was maturing and quickly becoming a viable business solution. Its first adopters were language professionals, the translator community. Initially, it was more freelance, mostly freelance translators and translation agencies, or the work doers. Despite their initial limitations, which was expensive, clunky, and often buggy, the early TM systems could address the core problem of the human translation process, limited throughput, a stubborn ceiling of 2,000 words per day. TMs automatically and reliably captured translations from individual contributors or small teams, recycled them for subsequent similar projects. For repetitive, iterative publications, like most tech publications, it was the way to go. For the language translation community, TM was a revelation, the killer app, a force multiplier that lifted the age-old human capacity limitation. It was the first true translation revolution. And, you know, I think a lot of people would agree with this as far as it being the first true translation revolution. I and mean, some would argue that the fax machine or the Internet was the first true translation revolution. Um, but I, from a language technology perspective, I would say this is absolutely spot on. Moving on to the second revolution, or what you call here, the next phase was a direct consequence of translation memory proliferation. At some point, it was only natural that the use of TM technology should extend to the content owners or the work givers, so moving upstream, who themselves sought to directly reap the benefits of translation memories. Client organizations could use the same technology which isolated content that had not been translated and automatically translate the content that had, including even fuzz and, or, um, Sorry, including even fuzzy matches that required only minor edits. And thus, TM traveled further upstream in the value chain. 
empowering the corporate customer. High-tech manufacturing, life sciences, any industry with global aspirations and a well-developed iterative publication culture, user guides, online help, owner's manuals, product descriptions, became relevant beneficiaries. So what we're seeing here is, uh, this is exactly what you said. Like it started off helping the translators and then now it's moving upstream to begin to help the, the work givers, so to speak. Yes, the, the... yes. And the, 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 there were two m main problems that translation management systems uh, solved or, or attempted to solve. One was, one was the problem of scale, right? So you had to work with a big um, team of translators and you had to use the collective product of their work and the subsequent problem was the problem of distribution. You had to get the uh, job distributed to everyone and then collect the work back. And, um, and this kind of centralization and automation was, uh, was really a big, big um, need from the enterprise point of view, because some of these customers ran very large uh, programs, They're still running very large programs. I remember when when I started working in translation, I um, worked as a project manager with a team of translators, uh, late late nineties, mid nineties. Um, the we had the internet, but we couldn't send big files and attachments to all the people that worked for us. And somebody would sometimes show up on a bicycle, and I, we'd have to give him a, a bunch of discs because. Um, it was faster than uploading or downloading content um, at that time. Um, so uh, I, I would say um, things like internet are the enabling infrastructure. They are the the super highway that um, that propels the development of the automobile, for example. Um, and um, yeah, right now we don't even think about it, right? It's obvious because you can you can get a movie streamed, so you can distribute all the work you want. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it the real scary question. Yeah, that's a good point. It's like we don't even think about it; we take it for granted. And the question that scares me is, what are our children going to take for granted when they're our age? Because that's the type of stuff that they're coming out with now, you know, chatbots, AI and stuff. They're going to be native users. They're not going to yeah. know a world that existed prior to AI, prior to chatbots. It's going to completely change the way that we do work. That, that is a very interesting point. Um, I, I think about it a lot. Um, I, I, so to me... Um, Chat GPT when I started using it, and then I quickly subscribed because I was fascinated by what you can do with it. Um, my big question was, what kind of representation of the world is it? And um, you know, when you're on Twitter, read articles, there, there's a lot of hype that this is sort of the knowledge of the world, or um, but but large language models do not know the world. They only know what other people said about the world. Right. So, so they are more of an epistemological engine that that has a representation of the world uh, from other sources. Now, having said that, there are a lot of um, articles about those emergent uh, capabilities that are just a function of, um, you know, a scale of learning that can be derived and and converted into unpredictable outcomes, and and that's. Um, that's also fascinating. Um, there is very little regulation, if at all, right? Um, there are some so people far. calling for slowing down of the development. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can really do that. Uh, it's uh, The cat is out of the bag. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of smaller models already, um, you know, secured as um, off-the-shelf um, uh, solutions, and people are training them or, or distributing them. So. Um, we'll just um, serve this wave. We will learn as much as we can. We will adjust our skills, both as individuals and as um, industries. Yeah. Um, and this time around, it's going to be different because it's not going to be specific to the translation industry. Obviously, it's going to mm -hmm. change everything um, or most everything. Yeah. Yeah, and it's getting a lot more attention because, you know, you didn't see a lot of New York Times articles written about machine translation. 
uh, as it's gotten more and more advanced because, you know, who yeah. cares? It's, it's specific to our industry, but this is something that pretty much everybody can get behind and everybody can understand, right? It's something that people can wrap their heads around. Everyone's seen Terminator, right? Everyone knows yeah. the Skynet, exactly. right? Exactly. So there's already a concept in our minds about it. Going back to the, um, your revolutions here. So we looked at the first revolution, um, of having translation management or translation memories. And then your second revolution that you um, put forth was having the management systems to actually manage the work. So translation management systems. So TM, TMS, translation management systems. And I'm just going to read a quote from the article and then we'll go on. I want to talk about machine translation after this. Um, so this is the second revolution. Once again, it's a multilingual magazine, the February issue. If you're following along at home, it's page 47, I think, that we're on. However, this new development had a set of interesting side effects. For starters, the small local TM model was no longer adequate. To scale, one had to find efficient ways to work with large teams. For example, distribute assignments, some bilingual pre-translated files, project translation memories, terminology databases, from work givers to work doers. Then one had to collect the completed or partially completed bilingual work from various parties, translators, editors, and reviewers, and make sure it could be efficiently reused. One had to merge multiple bilingual projects into a single multilingual deliverable. Parties had to agree on how to quantify the effort, which required standardization of the process, task, match, and rate definition. There we're talking about fuzzy matches. One had to figure out how to notify project participants that there is work waiting for them. The translation world needed a centralized TM, a standardized workflow, and reliable automation. Out of that necessity, a new category was born, a translation management system, or TMS the second translation revolution. And going on to talk about neural machine translation here, um, if MT can mostly handle most of the content, then perhaps the whole paradigm needs to change. In the machine-first world, does it make sense to default to processes and platforms optimized for the human translation supply chain? Ultimately, translation itself is a mean to achieving an end goal, the end effect of translated text on the target audience, selling a product, promoting a brand, empowering the user to get technical support, etc. And I, I love how you take us on a journey in your article through the evolutions and kind of talk about how the changes are different. Um, because when I'm looking at this, what, what I, I'm seeing a paradigm shift. It's not just a, a way in, it, it's not just the what we're translating, or the how we're doing our job, like we were talking about earlier. But this is like how we conceptualize the industry. And we're moving from a human first, oh, I'm gonna get some heat for this, but we're moving from a human first industry to a technology first industry or a technology first mindset, which, which is still centered on the end human, but it's centered not on the translators and the linguists so much, but it's centered on how Rather than ask, how can I translate this content? It's asking, how can I accomplish the goal? Well, what's the goal? The end goal is to sell more products, right? All right, what, then you take a step back and say, what tools are at my disposal? And neural machine translation is one of those tools. Um, human translators are another one of those tools. We've got a whole bunch of tools in our tool set, but it's not necessarily leading the conversation with human translators because up up until sorry and i'll stop talking here eventually <laughs> but up until this point i feel like we've always defined machine translation within the context of humans we've never just kind of let it be its own things like the quality of a, a machine translation is based upon how close it was to a human translator and one thing that people don't like to point out is human translators make mistakes all of the time you know, it's like how many how many people die in car accidents every day, but God forbid one self-driving car, you know, mm -hmm. runs over somebody because that's going to be national news. And I agree. I agree. Um, I, I think that you're right. Um, I would say even in an ideal world in which the human translation is always better than than machine translation, even then it would be a mistake to continue along the path that we've been continuing um, for now. And um, it's changing, but I think that um, 
the way that, that I like to think about it is instead of optimizing for a linguistic objective, we need to optimize for the business objective. Yes. And therefore, you will see that maybe using the same components of the solution that you have, but readjusted here and there in a different in a different workflow, uh, you will get closer to where you need to be. Um, in fact, um, my colleague Heather Rossi recently uh, wrote a blog post um, that's entitled "All Content is Suitable for Machine Translation." Um, and um, it's provocative, but I encourage you to go to um, uh, to our rws.com site and search for that blog because with the right mindset, the right attitude, or um, perhaps with the right understanding of how this content is going to serve the audience, uh, you can you can surely make that claim. Right here, I'll put a link in the chat for anybody that wants it. All content is suitable for machine translation by Heather Rossi. So go check that out on your guys' time. Yeah, and it, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a change in the way that we're thinking about it. And we're, we're looking at these trends that we see in the industry. And your article in Multilingual sums it up quite nicely at the end of the article. You, you, you list a bunch of trends. And... I, I'd love to just read all of these <laughs> at, at the risk of just boring people by reading for five minutes, but I, I will, I'll at least bring them up on, on screen here. And we just talked about, like what we just talked about is as machine translation continues to provide utility, the determination of good enough translation quality will become a major business consideration. How do I know which content requires human intervention? How do I know how good the translation is, this in its own right may as well become the next frontier and is perhaps worthy of a separate blog post. I, I see this, you know, I don't just agree with this. I see this happening on the client side. These are the conversations that, that client side local managers are beginning to have. You know, there's still the traditional conversations about how do I get better quality, right? Uh, the, the quality conversation is never going to die, and nor should it, nor should it. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is room is being made for some of these brave souls to step forward and say, well, wh wh what if we don't care so much about quality, right? What if, and by that, I mean, what if we stop focusing on LQA scores and start focusing on the end user experience, right? What's good enough for the end user? And if it's a technical document or how-to document, you know, some knowledge-based article that's only going to be read by 13 people in its whole lifetime, does it need to be perfect quality? Or can we use machine translation on it? And what we're seeing in the conversations that we're having with, with clients on the buyer side is how do I make sure that, I, like, I've got this much budget and this much content to do. How do I make sure that I'm maximizing that budget in the places where it's really going to make a difference, driving forward corporate KPIs rather than just driving forward localization KPIs. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's it starts with understanding your content, right? So right. within the con content landscape of a, of a big corporation, there will be this very brand heavy, marketing heavy, uh, you know, projection of this is who we are. This is how we want to convey ourselves to the world. This is what makes us us. And maybe that is the content that, you know, maybe we'll, we'll see a more trans creation being used now that machines will take care of some of the more pedestrian content. But if the same corporation um, needs to change, I don't know, um, needs to send an alert that uh, maybe they're um, they are moving their their, their shops or headquarters ch location um, or there is a press release um, or, or something like that and it's very urgent it needs yep. to be translated immediately uh, maybe it's just good enough maybe you can translate it now and then if if there's some correction uh, that needs to happen you can do it later um, I think that's that's another aspect that um, that um, is worth talking about is that the solution never moves along a single parameter. So quality from worse to better, 
You also have to consider all the other par parameters and whether you can achieve uh, the kind of optimal combination of those parameters. So data security is another parameter, yep. right? Um, it doesn't matter if I have the best machine translation system in the world, if I cannot use it on this particular type of content because I'm not allowed to send it to the cloud, right? Um, it's also speed. Um, doesn't matter if I have a secure machine translation system, if it cannot do, I don't know, 500,000 words per minute so that I can uh, get an intelligence insight and move my forces somewhere, right? So um, all of these things define the use cases and you have to understand how the use case is defined before you actually can build a solution for it. Yeah, yeah and we see like the content's like a quintillions, right? Quintillions to, to quote you, which is quintillions of bytes are going to need to be translated. And we see this, I think a great use case is Airbnb. And Airbnb has a full trans, um, not tra a full machine translation model. Everything goes through machine translation. And that's a necessity because if you think about Airbnb, Airbnb is mostly mostly user generated content because it's not providing a product in and of itself it's um it's introducing the um the what, what's their terminology that they use the hosts with the guests mm -hmm. right so the host if i'm a host i want to rent out my 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 house then i go in and i write my own description of the house and so that's user generated content and that needs to be translated and if every single host on the platform is writing their own content there's just not enough budget in the world to send that to a, a human translator so it absolutely needs to be machine translated yeah and, and you can see how the the mindsets are changing right because people see that this this stuff works and yep. Um, they also learn how to mitigate the risks. Um, I, I can give you an interesting example because Please. this was, um, so last year we, um, we were approached by a customer who needed to translate a lot of uh, SKUs, product descriptions in their marketplace, online marketplace. And they were produced, the text was generated by third party sellers, so they didn't have full control over that. But they had a lot of translation memories from their own um, uh, participation in the marketplace. So we, we knew that if we train the engine, it's going to be better than a generic engine. So we did that. And then um, before the holiday season, uh, we translated a backlog using this machine translation uh, engine customized for the customer. And the backlog was like 40,000 SKUs or something like that. And, and they said, what, well, well what should we do if something is mistranslated? So we said, well, guys, why won't you just publish on your site that this was translated by MT? Mm -hmm. And if the customer doesn't like the translation, let them let them mark it as not good. <laughs> crowdsource think, quality control. I love it. Right. Crowd, right. Crowdsource yeah. bug management. <laughs> right. And and here we here we go back to this whole concept about optimizing for linguistic output versus business output because what happened was very emblematic of it there were eight um eight customers uh found problems with the with the product descriptions mm. and we asked to have a look at those product descriptions and our customer came back <clears throat> and said you know what we cannot find this because those products already sold so our database purged them out. We already got your money. <laughs> so we achieved the business objective without perhaps pleasing everyone with the linguistic objective, which mm -hmm. is precisely the point here. Yep. Yep. And Winnie, I see your comment, your, your question over there in chat. Uh, Winnie, Winnie Hay from Middlebury asks, is anyone aware of any research that focuses on what's good enough for end users and how this has informed business models for client side orgs and LSPs. And yeah, I'll, please go first. Yeah, I think it's a very, um, very specific, right. you, you, you cannot answer this um, um, for the whole category. It's like um, asking can, what's you, the best TMS, <laughs> right? Uh, well, it's a, like asking what's the best dinner. 
Well, yeah, it, exactly. And it, it depends on every every customer, right. every and their end users. But but I agree with the, the, the in spirit, the question is correct. You mm -hmm. you have to this is the question you have to answer. And um, I think the one way to do it is um, you start with understanding the content, but um, understanding the content category is not enough to define the use case. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you would use one method to translate 500 different contrast, uh, co contracts to find the contract that is about the thing that you're looking for. Vers and you could use machine translation for that. You could use our content insights, for example, because we can generate um, extractive summarization, right? Machines can do it. But you would maybe prefer to use a human if you translate the contract so that it stands up in court uh, when challenged, right? right? It's the same material, it's but different use cases. So you use different different um, uh, approaches. Yeah, and. You know, every every organization is going to have a different relationship with their customers, and so the expectations are going to be different too. So we we do this work at at Nimsy quite frequently, actually. And like we, and this is the an, the question we help individual customers help help answer, or individual clients help answer for themselves, which is how good is good enough, and really it's. It's the end customers you have to consider, but it's senior management that you have to convince. And when you go to senior management and say, look, we're, we're proposing to implement XYZ workflow over, and it's going to save $12 million over the course of the next three years. Well, senior management's going to be pretty willing to overlook those eight pieces of feedback that customers <laughs> submit on the imperfections in the article. Yeah, uh, and uh, I just wanted to add this. This just describes the the content localization for publication, right? But there is a whole other uh, world of translation where you translate um, basically as part of content assimilation. You need to learn something. Uh, things like pharmacovigilance, um, digital forensics, mm. right? Uh, E-discovery. Um, you are dealing with massive. Uh, volumes of content that someone else produced and you need to figure out what it's about or find a particular relationship and stuff like that. Um, so there are a lot of use cases even within uh, a regular enterprise um, organization that will also fall into that category. Right, right. And we're, we're seeing that too. You know, organizations will say things like, well, for, for software localization, for example, well, if we have a brand new product that we've never localized before, then yeah, let's run it through the you know traditional workflow with human translators and quality control checks and you know blah 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 all of that stuff. But you know, three years later, when we've gone through three dozen different sprints to update that product, we have pretty robust robust translation memories. The major bugs have been fixed already then you know what's stopping us from just using machine translation to translate those sprints at least so that we can sim ship the product uh, ship it alongside with the english at least then and then maybe go back and do a quality control in you know the subsequent two weeks and and fix it because that's another thing that we have nowadays that we didn't have 30 years ago we have the ability to uplate update a lot of content on the fly so it's not this print it, ship it, and it ships with the bugs, it ships with the bugs, you're screwed. It's if there's issues, you can always go back and fix it later. Precisely. And then uh, that begs the question, where should the translation function live? Why can't it live with your content? <laughs> that does beg the question. And we're seeing, we're seeing those conversations happen too, you know, shifting localization left in the product development life cycle. And one of the interesting conversations, I don't think it's a serious conversation at this point, but it's an interesting to think about, is if I'm a marketing manager, why would I spend a lot of work working on developing my English campaign and then send it to the localization department to translate? 
because as a marketing manager, I'm going to be using new new tools, using AI to help me develop my English campaign. Well, why can't I just tell the AI develop this in 12 languages? And then what we're looking at here, and it, it goes to Yuri's point here on screen. Uh, he says, Chat GPT does not have an emotional intelligence, uh, was never born in a specific culture to understand all its nuances. I think in the future, localization will be more like MTPE. And this is what I see one route, or at least one workflow being created, is rather than having translation, we have post-edited machine-generated content for all mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. So the machine spits out the English, and at the same time it spits out 10 other languages, and there's still a human in the loop, but that human is reviewing the um, content that was created by the machine and adapting it rather than translating it from scratch. Yeah, that, that's is basically taking the same linguistic expertise we are selling one way today and repackaging it um, for the future. And mm. I think that this is, this is already happening. Uh, people have been experimenting with um, content generation. Um, I would, um, I, I think, you know, when you, when you look at it from this point of view, there are, there are a lot of types of content that have such a short, um, uh, such a short shelf life that they will go straight to publication, right? Hmm. Um, and um, I think I would be worried more about the, uh, our friends in marketing than I am about uh, the translation industry because um, a lot of, of these, um, these kind of tools may produce good enough copy. Um, in fact, um, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs um, that... Um, monetize their engagement on platforms like Twitter. And a lot of that stuff is already just pure GPT. It's, it's scary good. Like if I yeah. was a marketing manager or a marketing associate, let's say, and I got paid to write tweets, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, marketing assistants, I know your job is more complicated than that, so don't get mad at me. But, you know, if I if my job was to write social media posts and create social media posts, I'd be very worried because, you know, that is one of the things that ChatGPT, for example, does an excellent job of. I can go in, because I, I got the subscription too. I'm playing around with it. And I can go in there and say, write me a social media. I, I can say, hey, here's, here's a copy of this article that we just published. Write me a social media post to promote it. And mm -hmm. five seconds later, I've got a social media post. Yeah, I think um, what's going to happen where it, in a world in which most of the content is generated by the machine, um, we as consumers will seek something with um, an element of authenticity. I think so. And, uh, maybe imperfection, maybe, um, you know, a, a human weakness or something like that. Um, and that will be perhaps an even better um, expression of our skill than, um, than reading through pages and pages of uh, technical manuals or instructions and finding that somebody translated something as a spanner instead of wrench, right? Yeah. So I, I think that we haven't yet fully grasped what's going to, um, how it's going to affect us. I think that um, I am very excited about uh, these new developments. Um, it feels like an order of, of magnitude higher um, change or bigger change than when we were switching from statistical machine translation to neural machine translation, which was very difficult for some of the providers. And um, we were, we were um, happy to have a very good R&D team that, that could embrace that change and, and innovate. And I think we're, uh, we're doing the same right now. Um, there is um, an interesting interplay when you apply both large language models and um, uh, uh, purpose-built machine translation models together because you can achieve a lot of interesting things. Um, think about improving the input so it's more translatable. Um, 
yeah, uh, right. think about think about uh, rewriting the output for different um, register formality levels and so on. Um, and then the question is, uh, you know, we we move um, we move machine translation to on-premise solutions for certain types of customers um, who cannot use. Uh, public systems or multi-tenant systems um, by law or by by policy um, we have to do the same with large language models there will be um, there will be a huge market for that kind of solution yeah. for secure large language model um, and um, the I, you know I, I think that the 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 role of a translator will will change to maybe um, cultural uh, linguistic expert or something like that it could it could i mean the scary thing is we don't know right and that's what i mean our industry likes to uh, how do i put this our industry tends to kind of freak out about things when when there's new technology and I, i'm afraid that what's happening is um, a lot of linguists are going to leave the industry or new linguists aren't going to come into the industry because they don't see a future here. But I, I think your point is very good. I think there is a future. It might just not be translating words all day. Like if, if your dream job is to sit at a typewriter and translate words, then I hate to break it to you. Typewriters went out of style a long time ago, right? You don't get to do that. But you can still find fulfilling work as a linguist as long as you're willing to embrace the technology. I am very optimistic about this. Um, I think that the industry will adjust, people will develop new skills. They will find joy in doing that. Um, they will be happy to leave some of the boring stuff to machines. Um, the budgets for this will not significantly change yet, right? So. Right. There will be perhaps more money to be spent on human expertise, um, and um, maybe the 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 quality of output uh, that really matters is going to improve. So, um, I am uh, I am very optimistic about this. Me as well. Let's take a look at the comments here. I just want to say hi to everybody in chat who's been participating. I will bring you all. Oh, I don't have. There we go. We got lots of um, lots of different company or countries um, represented today. Let me see if I can control this. I can't control it. Oh, that's because it's locked. There we go. We've got Yuri um, from Ukraine, Marcel from Rwanda, Yuri, Tom, Tom O'Dwyer. Excellent discussion. It looks like this is aligned between speculative content and factual content, and what AI uses. Um, Winnie Hay, optimizing from a linguistic perspective versus optimizing from a business perspective. Good point. I think that's one of my takeaways from this conversation today, too, Winnie. Uh, localization for publication versus localization for assimilation. That as well. This needs to inform academia on their curriculum. Yeah, I don't envy academics trying to teach this stuff because, you know, it's changing every week. <laughs> It seems like, and when academia runs on a semester schedule, it's really hard to put a, a, a course together about this. And for those that we didn't see, oh, also Moti from Ethiopia. Awesome. Uh, Ethiopia represented today as well. Um, also, for those interested, I put a link to the article from RWS in the chat so you can go check that out. So why all content is suitable for machine translation. So... Bart, like I said, I would have loved to sit here and go through every single one of these bullet points, which are probably so small people watching on screen at home can't even read them. But I think we're running out of time today. So any closing thoughts that you have for us, final takeaways before we, we start wrapping it up? Um, don't be afraid of change. <laughs> um, learn as much as you can. Don't be... Uh, don't let the hype get to you. Um, I think that um, the world is changing in interesting ways and we can all uh, go along for the ride. Well put, well put, sir. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm going to wrap this up. I'll take us out here, guys, ladies, gentlemen, chat. 
We are out of time today. If you've enjoyed this NIMSI live experience, then join us next time. On next time, I might actually have my notes prepared to be able to tell you when next time is. But it's going to be this week. It's going to be May 10th, where we are talking about AI dubbing, how technology unlocks global content, featuring Valentin Marchenko. So if you're subscribed to NIMZ Insights, you can go to our LinkedIn page and find that and sign up for the event so that you'll get notified when we go live. Uh, once again, finally, my name is Tucker Johnson, host of NIMSY Live, and it has been my pleasure to join you all today. I appreciate our guest, Bart. I appreciate my colleagues here at NIMSY Insights doing all the hard work. I appreciate everybody in our industry who fills out NIMSY surveys and schedules briefings with our analysts so that we can include you in our published research. And finally, I appreciate you, the audience, who are joining us live today. I appreciate the dialogue and chat, everybody who left comments, questions, and especially criticisms. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Thank you.